Good afternoon, my name is Ryan Trost. Um, I'm here at SMB Capital, and today we are going to go over a trade in the SPIs using Tick that one of the trainees put on. Um, we're gonna go over what Tick is, how you can use it to make a better trade decision, how you can get better trade location, and kind of gauge overall momentum in the market using this indicator. We are going to talk a little bit about a specific setup in SPY today um, that actually happened on Monday. And you know the thesis for the entire trade was using an indicator called the NICE tick in order to effectively time an, an exhaustion point to the upside in the SPYs to set up a short setup. So we're going to go over a little bit about what tick is, how we could potentially use it um, to add edge to our pullback trend trading and as a way to evaluate how the market's moving under the surface. Um, so James, go ahead, kick us off. Alrighty, so like Ryan said, this was on Monday. Uh, this was just coming off the macro landscape of the news breaking with Pfizer uh, efficacy of their vaccine. Uh, the VIX was sitting at 23.9 and the vaccine news, it was good, very, very good news for the vaccine, but we were still a ways away from deploying it. There's, there's a long way from where we are today and uh, actually having a real impact on the economy. Looking at the big picture, this was that day, this was after the most of the session had come through. So these overnight highs were the highs of that day. So very, very strong, strong range uh, in the overnight session and uh, above average volume. Contextually, we were sitting about 400 handles up from top to bottom from this low here. That's a very, very uh, extended move. And something in the morning that was going through the back of my head while this was being prepared was if I was long already in this trade, which a, a lot of people were, is this a good place to take profit? If I was long and I saw this, what would I be thinking with this kind of a euphoric 15 minute candle in the uh, overnight session? Now, the actual key uh, kind of trade setup here, if we're looking at it, I was watching these these references as you pushed into all time highs. And uh, essentially for the bullish thesis to remain as we were coming up into here into the, the US cash open would be that we'd have to retain this primary uh, inflection. Any acceptance below this was then going to open the, uh, the, the possibility for continued selling as we push into this lower edge uh, and probe lower. So that was kind of the, the thesis coming into the morning and what we were looking for. And then here was the actual session. One of the things I had mentioned in the morning meeting was that I was gonna be looking for multiple failed attempts for dip buying and, and, and at the open, that's kind of what we started to see here with, with this very strong selling into the pre-market and then obviously many failed uh, dip buying events into the actual first few minutes. Uh, and the trade truly set up for me once we had this more capitulatory move lower and started to get these beautiful retests back into that inflection that we were watching uh, that I mentioned earlier on the profiles. Can you mention um, what the time frame is for this chart? Are you on a one minute, five minute? These are uh, 3,000 volume bars. So each candle is going to be 3,000 uh, contracts traded in the S&P 500 E-mini future. Great. So just to jump in really quick, a lot of people, you know, Dr. S talks about this a lot. Um, you effectively make your own bars based off of whatever type of evaluation you're looking to do. Some people like to use one minute candlesticks, one pe five minute, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of people move down to tick charts as well to get even lower time frame. And then the other way to do it, a lot of people who trade you know, market profile, volume profile, they like to build out their own type of volume bars. Um, and this is done, as James is saying, you classify, okay, this bar is not going to close until it, we see a certain amount of volume done. Um, during this this developing bar. So as soon as it, for his, as soon as it does 3,000 shares of the futures contracts, we're going to move on to the next bar. And it's a little bit of a different way to evaluate um, chart patterns and things like that, but it's a, a way to see what's going on under the surface. And especially if you're trading the spies and, and trading the indices, it's always better to build out contextually what's going on. Volume drives price. Um, and a lot of the times if you're just trading normal, you know, candlestick patterns, the spies have a tendency to wick above previous highs, stop out previous lows, and have a lot of noise. So, you know, effectively what he's doing here, which is similar to what I do, is looking at volume, 
looking at how volume is distributing over time and over price and using that as a way to formulate your edge as opposed to just simply trading off technical chart patterns. If you want to learn three more real world setups that our traders use, including the simple setup that we teach all of our new traders and the setup that turned one of our traders into a seven figure big money earner, check out the free webinar that we're currently running. Just go ahead and click the link that should be appearing now at the top right hand corner of your screen. That will open up the free registration page in a new window, so don't worry, you won't lose this video. You can also visit tradingworkshop.com to register for this free intensive workshop. You're going to learn more in a couple of hours from this trading workshop than from years of online education. So uh, another kind of key moment we'll run into here afterwards is, is viewing how this ran up in the overnight session and then how this, this moved lower. So something that these volume bars, just to add on to what you're saying, can help with is that you can visualize the amount of volume that's going into these moves simply based off of the amount of bars that are being printed. So uh, a move with more bars is gonna be a higher volume mo move than one with less bars. And so that's kind of a, a different way of viewing it than a standard volume histogram. Um, but the way that this, this trade ended up playing out is that there were kind of a few key moments within it and uh, obviously these were the, the, the two primary entry points. These were two areas that you needed to be prepared to get into this and, and ready to execute because there was a split second you had to actually get into these areas. You can see the down candle on this one is very, very quick, meaning it was very, very uh, low volume on the way down because we just popped up and immediately had extreme selling on the, uh, on the tape there. Um, and you also saw, as we'll go into with the tick, that you had these extreme ticks that then started to subside. But as far as trade management goes, there was a, a large waiting period down here. We just were holding, holding, holding. And this was kind of my final destination for that trade. So if you were into this short, then this was definitely a good place to, to pay yourself out some profits and then hold that core position in for the, that last push lower. Do you have a timestamp on, on that move down there? Uh, the one down there. I can pull it up when we when we look in the tape. It, it looks to me it probably is correlating with what I'm looking at. It's like almost 10 o'clock. Yeah, 10.04. 10, yeah. Uh, 10, yeah, 10 o'clock. So, you know, as you're looking to build that out, so you were using simply these volume bars. Do you have another chart up with, you know, VWAPs, any moving averages, or are you just simply trying to follow the volume? I have a whole lot of charts up. <laughs> I don't yeah, go sure. over some of this. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, interestingly enough, off that first failure, that period where you're saying we're spending a lot of time and it's looking like they're doing a lot of volume, trying to can't really push us lower, just kind of consolidating. That is roughly the VWAP in the 24-hour session in the futures as well. So it does make sense that we would bounce there a little bit. But the more interesting setup, which is what we really want to go over here, I think, is that next bounce that comes up, that second red arrow that you have, is where we see an actual really solid tick fade setup. So um, do you have a, a chart with this and the tick setup? Yeah, it's, it's fun. Cool. So let's take a quick peek at this. And so, just for context, the main gray bar there is gonna be your positive negative 600. The gray line is your uh, zero line. And then the up and lower bounds are a thousand, negative a thousand. Mm -hmm, great. Now let's dive into a little bit about what we're looking for in these scenarios. All right, so now we're looking at the same day. Um, a, this is just a one minute normal candlestick chart. So you can see it's very similar in structure to what you were seeing on that volume bar chart that he had set up. But the only difference here obviously is, you know, we just have volume on the bottom and these are just time based candles as opposed to volume based candles. But just to highlight, just to catch us back up, fill the gap here. This is his original arrow. And this is his second arrow. So this is the period he was talking about where it looked like buyers were trying to buy the dip on a strong gap up. You can see we fail off of that and we come down and this is where we're starting to pay attention to the ticks here. We have a really strong distribution of the ticks. So effectively what we're looking for, just to give a little bit more context, is when we're trading and looking at the nice tick, this is basically how many stocks are currently on an uptick and how many stocks are currently on a down tick. When that number's positive, more stocks are trading on upticks, and when it's negative, more stocks are trading on down ticks. Anytime we have strong ticks holding above 400, holding above 500, 600, that's when you start to notice that institutional participants could be buying basket stocks. When you have six, seven, 800, those really large numbers, that's when you see, okay, the only people who can make this many stocks at one time hit upticks 
are institutional participants who could be buying basket stocks. So anytime we have the ticks kind of meandering between the positive and negative 400 area, kind of in these zones, that's indicative of some type of backwards price act, back and forth price action, you know, consolidations, things like that. There's not really any directionality getting put to work. You know, no big, large basket buying programs are getting put in, no big selling programs coming in. And, you know, when you look at the price and look at what's price actually doing, you do see that it makes sense where we're not seeing any big types of buying or selling, thus we have a consolidation in price. And I should say this isn't always, you know, a final indicator of what's happening under the surface, but it can provide edge to make a little bit more sense of what's going on with price. So when we look at these two symbols, this is where his first arrow was. You know, we're looking right here. And then the second arrow was right here. Let me get rid of these bubbles so we can see the candles a little bit better. We, we get the breakdown, we come down, and he had kind of built out the reference area like this. He had said, okay, I'm gonna use this as my reference area where they originally tried to buy the dip, and as soon as they break down, any retests of those breakdown points, technically speaking, could be good opportunities to get short. That's great. You know, in any type of normal in-play stock, you'd be looking to try and short this breakdown period. Maybe you'd give the stop up to here. Maybe you'd stop out even at the top of this consolidation. But when we're trading the spies, we're looking to get a little bit better execution and trade location is extremely important. <coughs> and the way that we can get better trade location is by using the tick. So anytime we get these big six, seven, eight hundred ticks all the way up here, they can be indicative of exhaustion in price. They're buying, buying, buying stocks, buying stocks, buying stocks, but they can't get price higher. They can't take out previous swing lows. They can't rebid us into areas of value. And even though they're buying large amounts of stocks, you know, using programs or et cetera, they really can't push price up. That's exactly what a tick fade exhaustion setup looks like. So that's the first one. We get a retest, even if you didn't have the tick, right? Like even if we blocked all this out, you might be the person who would still short this just because it's a technical play. So that's one way to do it. But where we really start to see the tick come into play and allow us to have a little bit more edge to either not get out of our short or even reshort is this instance right here. And this is the one I really want to highlight because this is the first time you actually see a very solid play based off the tick. We got the breakdown to VWAP, couldn't really get negative ticks, but then you start to see the structure come up like this where you know, we're building up, we're building up, we're building up, we're kind of bouncing off of VWAP nicely, and then you get kind of a wide range one minute bar that pushes right up to these previous invalidation points. As we're pushing up to those points, you see the ticks hitting extremes on the day. You know, normally I would say this right here off the open, we're gonna block that out. In the first five, six, seven, eight minutes, um, especially if you're using think or swim, these tick values can be skewed, um, and they're not necessarily always gonna be very accurate. They're usually based off the gap, you know, if you have a big gap up, they're going to have very high values. If you have a big gap down, they're going to be very low values. Um, but after the first 10 minutes, you can see it start to normalize. And then once it normalizes, then after the first 10, 15 minutes or so, you could use it as a really solid indicator. So as we're bouncing back up, we get a wide range bar right into the previous breakdown point, previous failure point. And on that, we get a big exhaustion type tick, eight, 800, 850, which is indicative of exhaustion. Later on, you could see even the 1,000 ticks are good. You know, if you look up here, you see big 600 plus ticks being used as areas where buyers just can't get it done anymore and we fade. Even here, buyers can't get it done and we fade. And even here, buyers can't get it done and we fade. The important thing to recognize is just because we're getting these extreme ticks and that might be an area where sellers are going to step in off of exhaustion, does not mean that there is a trade there and does not mean that there's a bigger pattern. Where it really starts to become a powerful trading indicator is when you use it in correlation with other things. So in this example, right, as we're shorting up here, we see previous failure point, previous breakdown point, the 50% retracement in the futures, which can often act as resistance on down selling days, this entire reference area here. And that's kind of how you set up a really nice opportunity to use the tick as an exhaustion mechanism to get short and then you kind of hold and then you're looking for, honestly, you're kind of just following price. Normally you'd look to see if you get some type of momentum shift to the downside in the ticks where you know, we get this upside value tick, we come back down and then we start to see some better negative ticks 
that would be a better setup for you know, a, a more aggressive failure. But because we're above VWAP, we have this really strong gap, it does make sense if you think about it to not see you know, a real large breakdown come initially from this. It's likely we're gonna need to consolidate a little bit more, let the sellers kind of build up the steam, trap some buyers potentially before we get the bigger move, which doesn't really happen until later in the afternoon. But you can see, as we start to move, we kind of bounce back up, the ticks distribute more to the positive side. You know, the ticks are distributing positive basically throughout this entire consolidation, maybe getting some people long, maybe making some people sweat out their shorts a little bit, still holding the 50% retracement of the day. Then when we start to roll over, especially on the close, you can see some real directionality comes into the close. Well, if you look at the close and the ticks, you can see we're seeing new tick lows consistently. You know, new tick lows get put in, especially on the close, we're seeing real negative sustained downside values. Yeah. That's when you start to see sustained momentum. So tick is really just an indicator for is momentum speeding up, is momentum slowing, use it in correlation with price, and you can see those things kind of come together. Momentum was kind of strong in this little up move, and then the momentum halts when they exhaust themselves, buying a little bit too much. So initially it can feel kind of counterintuitive. You know, when I went over this early on with the previous class, we saw a lot of times where they'd say, ooh, we're, we, you know, we have six, 700 ticks, doesn't that mean real buyers are stepping in? How come we're not going higher, and how come we're not continuing to go higher? Well, all momentum eventually comes to an end with some type of exhaustion, capitulation, things like that, or we stall out. So you can see situations like this, you know, as we're kind of consolidating and consolidating, you can see they're trying to push us higher and they can't, trying to push us higher and they can't, and then price continues to move lower, and that's when tick, once you kind of get that invalidation and we exhaust, it makes sense to not think too hard into these individual upwicks, um, unless you're like a hyper scalper, it's really hard to do in the spies because Obviously, the order flow is just all over the place. Um, but if you use tick at inflection areas as a way to gauge exhaustion, that's when you can have a really good edge and you know, kind of iron out your trade execution, trade location, in order to have better risk reward on your setups. OK, let's bounce right back into your charts. Yeah, I just had one question. Is there ever a, a point where tick divergence is significant relative to other swings? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I think it, it happens, um, there's certain times when it happens, and if you look for it, here's what I'll say, if you look for it too much, that's when you can run into a little bit of trouble. Um, there are often times where you'll see a little bit of a, um, a tick divergence, and in your head you'll be like, like, oh, you know, they made a new low, or they didn't make a new low in the spies, but they made a new low in the tick, which means they were selling even more stocks to the downside, but they couldn't bring us to a new low. Um, maybe, maybe that's an opportunity right here. Here's actually a, um, a pretty good example of a tick divergence right here that we could use. While it may not have been at any important inflection areas, let's look at how this sets up, right? So this is from, I think this is Tuesday now. We'll be jumping around a little bit. Yeah, this looks like Tuesday's session. So we're coming, we're trading above VWAP. We collapse underneath VWAP. You know, we kind of are coming back into this trend. And as we come down, we put in a big tick low, negative 800, sign of exhaustion. We, we kind of put that tick in, we bounce shallowly, but then we're making new lows. So as they're making new lows in the spies, you know, price in the spies is now making new lows for the afternoon. But as that's happening, they can't get more and more stocks to go sell. You know, they're selling less and less stocks as they're making new lows in the spies that could be indicative of under the surface, this is just a stop run, this is just a, a low being put in that's gonna spoof, stop run, et cetera, whatever you wanna call it. This can be a way to recognize that in real time and be like, okay, we're making new lows in the spies on decent volume. Is this some type of stop run to get out everybody who tried to buy the shallow pull in from VWAP or tried to buy the 50% retracement? And you can see that playing out in real time as very quickly, you know, almost five, six minutes later, we get a new tick high from, you know, if you start the, you know, start the track right here from the breakdown, we break down, this is a new tick high from when we broke down, and then you start to see a very obvious momentum shift. We got big tick lows, they come up, make a new tick high, and then you can see for the entirety of this move right here, as spies trading above VWAP, right back to that breakdown point, 
we're getting solid positive tick distribution, which is signs of a momentum shift off of a tick um, divergence. So that's a very quick example of it. Definitely tradable if you were around for it. You know, it doesn't always make sense and it's not always very prudent to start looking for these all over the place. All right, so I just pulled up, this is actually that trade you were just talking about. One thing I'm already learning just from what we've talked about is I need to get tick to be a lot bigger because right now I'm running it uh, relatively small. Um, but I just wanted to kind of bring up the fact of, of how quickly this trade took place. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll just start playing it here as we run into this inflection. And you can start to see those are sales below the uh, bid, the, the dark red ones there. Is this the first, you know, when you, you mark the two arrows that had the short setups, this is the first of it? This one is uh, here. The first arrow was this first pullback on this. Got it. Yeah, you can skip as far to what you were going to show. Oh, okay. Um, so that was just going to be... I think that's, just because I think that's the better setup. Um, I Just for me, I don't usually short that first initial test of a breakdown point, um, especially, you know, judging off the overnight strength. I think that's a little bit of a tougher trade. Um, obviously, it ends up working and, you know, it looks really clean in After Effects. But just because as we are retesting that, you don't really necessarily know where it's going to go. They could stretch it all the way to the top of that consolidation. It could be a false breakdown. Um, so it's a little easier to let it prove itself, let it trade and make new lows all the way to VWAP, and then short the bounce off of VWAP. Okay. Now, following on with just how, how I'm using tick, is there a way, because this sequence that followed up, where is it? Right around here when it starts to consolidate and mm -hmm. consolidate and consolidate, is there a way I can leverage tick to essentially build conviction to keep a trade on? Sure, the way that you would do that is if you really wanted to dive into it. Normally for me, because I don't really like to overthink my trades, you know, I put the execution on from good trade location, I have a target in mind and everything that happens in the middle of that is normally just noise and I'm trying, you know, sure, I like to watch and, and make sure that we're not, you know, making higher lows or making, um, you know, consolidations breaking higher consistently or ticks aren't you know, un completely unable to make lows. If you're seeing those things that can invalidate your trade in real time, maybe you take a little bit of risk off. Um, I don't usually nitpick my positions that much. Uh, I usually, in this situation, would be looking for a VWAP breakdown. But in terms of using the tick to try and evaluate how your position stands, I would say, yes, as we start to consolidate off of that low being made and you're watching the ticks, you can see that, you know, if you pulled it up, even as we're getting, you know, four or 500 ticks getting put in, which, you know, are, is decent buying, not really sustained buying, but it's okay. As that's happening, price isn't moving at all. You know, we couldn't even get back above 36.20 in, in the futures. And then even when we put in another 600 tick, um, we put in that 600 tick and then we can't even make a higher high. You know, we make that lower high right around, um, 36, 26, 50, which is, looks like is the candle that's being put in right now on what we're looking at. Yeah, this was that, that squeeze point on that trade. Yeah, so if you click play, this will probably play out on that lower high. So you can see they're buying, buying, buying. The tick is starting, the tick grows all the way up to 600 on this move. See it's stalling a little bit in the 40s can't really push up to the 50 cent area. Flirting with it, you know, it was about 50 cents for just a second. You can kind of see the tape's really kind of sticking up there in the 40s, and boom, we're rejecting right back into the 30s. Seeing what it can do. So, you know, if you're short from that previous swing high, a little bit to the left of this current developing move, as you start to see this fail, you know, we couldn't really get back above 50 cents. You know, you were short from the top of that wick if you were trading off of that big exhaustion tick. As you start to see, okay, we just got another 600 tick of basket buying and they made another lower high. That's kind of confirmation. And then any consolidations based off of that, you're just holding. Um, I wouldn't think into it anymore. As soon as they make that next lower high, you can say, okay, I can probably set this to even break even. It looks like we're going to consolidate. Any breakdown from that VWAP point 
or from that previous swing low at 10 o'clock that we originally targeted. Any breakdowns from there, maybe I start taking off a little bit of risk if I see any negative 600 ticks, um, any exhaustions to the downside. Yeah, this was that point where you can see the tick really kind of c c capitulated and pushed lower. And yep. You finally started to test that zero line again. Yeah, exactly. And then it comes back to zero and just kind of is, you know, moving between positive 300, negative 300, you know, consolidation type move. And then you get a negative 400 tick that breaks us down. Then we kind of come back up and we're putting positive ticks in again, but we can't get back above the VWAP in the futures. And then you start to see, obviously, this is ahead of where we're looking on the on the current video, but that's how this ends up playing out. We kind of come down, um, we consolidate a little bit, then we end up breaking that swing low. And this whole time, the ticks, even when they put in positive 600s, aren't able to bring price any higher. Okay, I was also curious if you could uh, explain what you think some of the common pitfalls or fallacies are when using tick. Yeah, 100%. So these days that we're targeting right now and, and we're looking at are obviously really good examples of when it works. But there are also examples of where it can run you into a little bit of trouble. And that usually happens on trend days. So on trend days, you will have these big thousand ticks get put in or big five, six, seven hundred ticks where even though they're putting in exhaustion type ticks, you are not getting any type of fades. Let me scroll back and see if I can find the most recent day where we saw some of that. It is interesting because in you know recent times a lot of the moves have been happening in the overnight session so we've been having a lot of kind of consolidation based days here's a good one right here all right so this is all the way back on the day after the election um, the fourth so early on in the session we open this is a five minute bars we kind of compress and break higher every one of these little yellow dots is when a thousand tick gets put in but you can see Normally, you know, if we're thinking about fading some type of directionality, a big thousand tick can be when momentum slows. But on this day, we see sustained ticks above 600. You see ticks holding, ticks holding, ticks holding, ticks holding. Even when they wake it back down, the ticks come right back up into really sustained basket buying. And even after this thousand tick, we continue to push higher, push higher, push higher. We put in all of these exhausted type moves, but then we just consolidate and continue to move higher. So that's when it can be a little bit of a fallacy. I think I actually even ran into a little bit of trouble on this day because you get those big thousand ticks into what could potentially be resistance. Obviously, we have, you know, sellers could step in anywhere along this uptrend, especially after the election, because um, we still at this time didn't know, you know, really who was going to win yet. You know, people are stepping in and doing this, that, the other thing. You see these thousand ticks not being faded. It's very easy to get caught either selling your long too early because you think this is an exhaustion move or trying to short because you think that um, the market's exhausted off of these thousand ticks. So this first one gets put in if you short, you know, 344.40 um, in the spies, you know, it, it ends up moving another two dollars in, you know, less than 10 minutes just based off of how strong this buying was up here. So that's when you can run into a little bit of trouble on trend up days and trend down days. If the ticks are, you know, vastly distributing to one side. It usually is better to just use price action and obviously not really step in front of a, a moving train. Okay. And are there other, ever situations where you're going to see uh, extreme, extreme negative ticks holding, 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 but price just keeps chugging higher? Hmm. Interesting. I, I haven't seen a divergence that, that crazy before um, where, you know, price is going up, but we're holding negative ticks. If that happens, it would probably be there is some type of, significant divergence across the indices like maybe they're selling a bunch of small caps or selling big caps but no i haven't really seen price grind higher as we are seeing negative ticks in the current volatility environment maybe back when the vix was like you know sub 15 the market would just kind of grind higher but they're you know they're selling certain stocks under the surface um it's tough to say i don't think i've ever seen a, a divergence that bad that doesn't correct itself very quickly Gotcha. And when the volatility does increase, like it did, say, back in March, do your levels of what is considered an extreme then shift? So is yeah. like an 1,000 tick now supposed to be a 2,000 tick, or how does that? No. Well, I think the highest ticks I've seen maybe in my career is like 1,650 or 1,700. I think when the pandemic first started, I think we saw like a big downside tick like that. Like if I went to a daily, you know, these ticks down here, negative 1,700. 
I don't think this, these ticks down here are false prints, obviously you can see that those aren't real. Um, on this day, the first day off the top, it looks like we saw, you know, obviously we V-bottomed and then in June, it looks like we saw a pretty serious negative tick. This may have been one of the biggest negative ticks in recent history, but obviously coming off of the lows, we would have days where, you know, we would have negative, this day we had a negative 1500 tick, but then we also had a positive 1500 tick. Um, and obviously that was a very crazy volatility environment. So in those situations, yes, you have to be careful. Um, think, uh, you know, adjusting one, your sizing, and you know, that's a whole nother story. You adjust your size to the volatility environment. But even as, you know, in, for an example today, as we've been talking, you, we've seen the market put in a low breakdown, and look, we put in a thousand tick down here at 1246, but even then the market is sustaining these negative ticks and selling us lower and lower and lower. And then as soon as we pop back up, we actually put in a big negative tick today. This negative tick gets put in, we bounce, and then do we put in a higher low with this exhaustion tick? You know, we're starting to see the ticks start to distribute a little bit and less negative. You know, maybe we get a big move back above the overnight low that has like a four or 500 tick. But right now you can see we're very distributed to the downside ever since we broke down from VWAP up here. So, you know, it's a nuanced thing. You don't want to get to the point where you're, it's your sole mechanism. You know, you're doing everything off of tick. Like if a tick gets put in like this off of negatives, like, oh, I have to be short here. I have to be short here. Still build out your inflections. Still look to only trade from really good trade location. But if you know, this is the difference between us talking about, all right, if price gets to this 50 cent band in the spies, where am I going to put my risk on? Am I going to, you know, start at the beginning of that zone or am I going to wait to the back? Using tick can help you get better trade location, and obviously the better your trade location, the better your risk reward, and that's the entire purpose of using um, an indicator like the tick. You know, obviously there's merit to using it to kind of figure out momentum situations, you know, as we're consolidating here, selling, 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 but as soon as we kind of, we see these positive ticks get put in and the ticks start to shift momentum early this morning, even before we've broken out of this consolidation, we get this first positive tick even before we've taken out the consolidation, see more ticks, more ticks, more ticks, more ticks, more ticks, and then right here, this isn't until 10, 12 that we actually start to take out the highs, we've already had distributed positive ticks. So it can be a little bit of an, a leading indicator in those instances, um, but not always. And it's something that takes practice to read and you don't want to get too caught up, th you know, watching tick by tick on a one minute chart, using it around your major inflections that are built off of know, volume profile or, or, you know, whatever type of way you have to build out your own levels, using it around those inflections is the way to really have, you know, solid edge. Gotcha. So it's definitely lower on the hierarchy relative to context. And yeah, 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 yeah. You go, you go context, um, your levels, uh, obviously intraday price. Um, and then on under the surface, you know, you can go under the hood to see how things are developing is when I use things like the advanced decline line. Um, and the nice tick to, to try and gauge momentum situations, gauge who's in control, time my executions a little bit better, the AD line's a little bit better for kind of looking at underlying momentum, is this a rotationary environment, is everything kind of moving together. Um, it's all about building that bigger picture when eventually you come down to actually executing your trade ideas. Will you ever change like the size of your trade or how, you, how much you're willing to risk on a trade relative to if the lower, those lower tools are going to be confluent or dissident with your thesis? Mm, usually no. If anything, I'll hold more size if it looks better. If it doesn't look bad, often, like if it looks bad, like let's say, you know, the AD line is not making highs as we're making highs and there's a little bit of a divergence, you really want to watch in real time and be like, all right, are they going to take this divergence out? Is this divergence just because IWM is not as strong? Um, it, you do have to make sure that every situation is not going to be the same and it's not always going to be playing out exactly how you expect. So you have to make sure that in real time you're doing everything top to bottom. How are we on the hourly? How are, you, how are we down on a five minute, one minute? Then how are we on the internals? And putting all of that together is the way that you can really start to make um, a strong evaluation of what's going on. I don't usually change my sizing based off of the market internals. Um, I usually trade, change my sizing based off of what's happening um, on higher time frames. Like as in today, like I didn't make any trades today because you know I wanted to short this. I was kind of talking about that in the 11 a.m. meeting. I was trying to short this, but it didn't quite peak up to where I wanted it from. Um, 
but even then today, you know, I would have been a little bit smaller size on this just because we were in a consolidation type environment. But then as soon as we break lows and we start to expand the range a little bit, um, you start to press it and, and maybe you, you think about, it. you know, are we going to go a little bit lower? Are we going to go all the way to 3500, 3505? Um, maybe you start to size up as the ranges expand. But then again, you know, the range is expanding, sizes you up automatically, so you have to make sure that you're keeping track of both of those things in real time. Would be interesting to see if we didn't bounce from right here. You know, as we put in these, you can start to see the situation developing. You know, is this going to be a higher low that gets put in, or are we going to see more sustained negative thousand ticks that even bring us to a new low? I don't have my levels up on this chart, um, so I don't really have that good of an idea of where we are. Um, yeah, that morning sequence with the tick holding below the zero line and then breaking above is almost that leading indicator. That was a really interesting sequence for someone who's new to the tick. Yeah. And uh, I, I didn't know if that was something that was repeatable or common uh, in seeing it. What I'll say is you'll see repeatable patterns all over the place. Um, and they don't always, you know, do the same things. There's always going to be different scenarios that happen. I basically was thinking that we were going to get some type of negative six, 800 tick on this low that would have set up an exhaustion trade to trade back towards the top of the range. But since we didn't get that, and you know we're holding negative ticks, but they can't push us lower, they can't push us lower, they can't push us lower. As I started to see that, I was like, all right, we're probably gonna go up. I don't think there's a long setup here because I don't like risking this wick low. I don't like risking here either. I think the real risk is the overnight low. We're a little bit too far away from that risk reward wise because I don't think we're gonna go right to the overnight high unless the momentum situation really starts to change. So in that situation, yeah, it was a little bit unique to see negative ticks as we're not really selling off. But that tells you, okay, maybe we need to go higher for sellers to really get it done. Or buyers are willing to buy here and we're getting acceptance and we're gonna need, we need to push higher and, and see how they manage the situation. But it would be interesting to see whether or not that's not a higher low um, on the day's time frame. Even though I think my levels are basically like right here to that's kind of the inflection area I have. Looks like it wicked below it a little bit. So we'll see if we can kind of stabilize here and, and push back up or if we're going to continue to roll and, and trend into the afternoon. Um, but I think that's, we basically covered everything. I don't want to, you know, have this go on for too long. Uh, we've gone over a lot with the tick. Thank you for putting that together for me. Um, and I hope everybody learned something a little bit more about using some market indicators about what's going on under the surface in order to make stronger trade decisions um, in the spies. Hey, go ahead and click our subscribe button so you don't miss any of the videos they're producing for you in the trading community. And please take the time to add your feedback in the comment section for what videos you'd like for us to produce next and what you found helpful from this video from all of us at SMB. Train and trade well.